Carmela Vienna, who is a Rant Random and Cap co-founder and artist, talking tonight about her handling of materials as well as the representation of trauma within her work. Carmela Vienna is a sculptor from Birmingham, as well as a co-founder and desk curator of online arts organisation Round Lemon, currently undertaking a BA in fine art. Her practice is oriented by materials and processes, as well as notions of trauma. As she says herself, my work relies on a symbiotic relationship between mind, pain, relationships and process. Whilst my mind compels me towards specific materials, my intuitive processes are influenced by my instinctual response to material properties. Through this process of art working, my pain is subconsciously manifested in my work. Most recently, Carmela's work has involved the use of kinetic motors and throwaway materials, generating a comical and repetitive form of anticipated trauma. I'm so sorry. You should have stuck in my arms and eyes. I really apologise, Carmela, and everyone who's come to watch today. The concept of anticipation is also explored in her piece of writing, Manifesto for Anticipated Trauma. And with that, I'm quickly going to pass on to Carmela. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> so funny. Let me just try and share my screen and I'll get started. Can everybody see? Yep. Cool. Right. So as Bethan said, um, I'm an artist from Birmingham. My name is Carmela. I work predominantly in sculpture nine times out of 10, and I'm a very materials orientated artist. Um, my work isn't really about any specific themes. Um, also, my affiliation with Round Lemon is that mm. I am the Zest curator um, which is the Round Lemon blog space. Also a co-founder, as well as my friends, Ryan, Andrea and Bethan. Um, so firstly, I'm going to just talk about my practice as a whole. Um, like I said, it doesn't have any kind of specific context. I don't go into the studio and think today I'm going to make like a feminist piece of work or anything like that. Um, it's more of an intuitive based practice. So I really think, I don't think when I make at all, I kind of just let my hands do the work and let myself guide me through the process. Um, and most of my work is on a blank canvas a lot of the time. So they're sculptures, but they're kind of drawings as well. And the intuition is based on two main elements, which I'm going to talk about now. So my practice is based around the combination of both form and materials. So in terms of form, what I mean by that is the arrangement of the materials and what kind of shapes they create, the kind of lines they create as well, sculpturally as a drawing as well as the kind of structures, the materials form with each other and their composition. And also the materials I kind of categorize my practice into include um, industrial materials. Um, and these include kind of wire, bubble wrap, plastic. The second category I would form my practice on is bodily and naturally mater natural materials such as latex, hair, feathers and also I've been recently working with reed fluff and the third category of materials I use are usually discarded or throwaway materials. Um, peculiar objects I like to call them, strange objects. Um, one of my works also includes um, the use of old ceramics um, so yeah, and with the materials, there isn't kind of any rules I go by when I'm making my work. Sometimes um, my work is just made from discarded or throwaway materials, whilst other times it's a combination of all three categories. Um, I would like to think that I could make a formula for the kind of perfect artwork I create with these materials but I haven't yet discovered that. Um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about my influences. Um, the first is female sculptor Eva Hesse. She's a German artist based in New York and most of her like what I'd say her best works were created in the late 1960s. Um, she uses a lot of latex, um, fiberglass, and one of her pieces, Ort, in the top left corner, um, is one of my favourites, as it's this latex painted onto canvas, and she's gone and stitched the edges up and filled the these massive giant bags and hanging them on the wall. Um, and the gallery that this is kept in, the curators and the archivists um, don't know how to preserve these works anymore because the latex has started to degrade. And I find that impermanence of her work very interesting. And that's kind of an aspect I've carried on with my work. Um, also, another artist I'm really interested in is Alina Spotsnikov. And she's a Polish artist um, who uses a lot of resins and bodily casting. And I have wrote about her on Zest. Um, I'm sure that Bethan will drop the link in the chat to this particular chapter of my Women Artists series. But um, one of my favourite um, theorists, Griselda Pollock, described her work as a site for encrypted trauma. And this is something I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. Um, so this is the first piece I made, which I think was the start of my practice. Um, I used latex and hair and I was making these little wrap kind of tails in the studio and found a piece of scrap chicken wire and banged some nails into the wall and kind of played with this formal element, um, attached the rats on and let gravity be a really important part of this piece. Um, it's quite minimalist and formal and it's a work that's very like precarious. It could literally just fall off the wall at any moment. And even when you were to walk past this piece, the hair would blow in the wind and the tails would kind of jingle. Um, so it's this detail and understated kind of element to the work that kind of makes the viewer want to look at it at a closer inspection. Um, another work I created with latex hair and chicken wire is this piece. Although I don't think it's as formally successful as the previous piece, um, I really enjoyed the process of hand painting the latex onto the chicken wire in layers and watching the build up. It was a very therapeutic process. Um, and I also apologize for the quality of these images because I did not record these pieces very well. And it's important to note that these pieces that I make are just destroyed after I don't keep them. I did try and archive this particular piece, but I had nowhere to store it. So I kind of threw it away. But the point is that a lot of my materials that I use are often reused in my work in other elements. So this takes me on to the next work I created um, at university. We were doing a project with um, the Fierce Archive. I don't know if you guys know, but Fierce Festival is a festival held in Birmingham and it's a queer performance and contemporary art festival. And we got to work with their archives, which are in Birmingham Library. And um, we kind of went down there, looked at the archives and we used that material as um, something as research material to then respond to. But because, like I said, my work doesn't really um, base itself around ideas, it bases itself around the material, I kind of chose to focus on building my material language, but in the context of ar archives. 
So all of these materials I used, like the latex, the blue tack and the duct tape, I kind of put in an archival arrangement in a gallery space, which is a very like clinical space, I would say, just to see how the materials would work in the space. Like, does this change the value of the materials now that they're in this really kind of clinical form? And then I kind of reflected on the work and I started to see these little assemblages and as um, kind of remnants of trauma and reading into Griselda Pollock again, talking about Alina Spotchnikoff's work. Um, she described her work as clumsy and awkward objects. And despite everything, I persist in attempting to fix the in the resin. What am I saying? Despite everything, I persist in attempting to fix the in resin, the imprints of our body. I'm convinced that among the manifestations of perishability, the human body is the most sensitive, the only source of all joy, all pain and all truth. So I kind of saw my work in this light and this context of it being unconscious imprints of my own body within my work. Even some of the material itself is my body, like the hair in the background. So there was this new kind of layer of trauma, which was seeping into my works. So in the context of trauma, I decided to research a little bit more how female artists use their own personal traumas within their work. So I decided to focus on both Frida Kahlo and Lady Gaga as um, two people to focus on. And I um, researched into Frida Kahlo's painting, Henry Ford Hospital and Gaga's video 911. Um, and this is um, an essay which is read through a matrixial approach. So this is a feminist approach that aims to um, like kind of read the work through a universal lens rather than the, through the lens of like a white male or whoever you are. It's kind of a lens that seeks to find the trauma from its root through the artworks themselves. It's available to read on Round Lemon website. I'm sure Bethan's just dropped the link in the chat as well. So this is the Frida Kahlo painting I analyzed. And I'm showing these because visually they um, have kind of like manifested in my own works in terms of the use of um, trauma through blood. And also in Lady Gaga's video, the red anklet on her foot is used to symbolize the injury she sustained in her psychotic episode. So the red is a signifier of trauma. And through this, I went to produce a small series of work called the Traumatic Anthropocene. And here I took advantage of a snowy day, which we never get, and used these reds um, paints in oils and acrylics um, in the snow. And it was interesting to see how the materials reacted with the snow. Um, the oil paint kind of froze and turned quite clotty, um, which kind of was a signifier of blood again. And the Hessian in this context, especially on the picture of the right, um, you can see it's kind of like umbilical cord like, like in Frida Kahlo's painting. So through my subconscious, when I was writing my essay and researching about these artists, their kind of imprints of kind of passed through me and come back out of me again in my work. And this was the display photo for this talk. I just thought I'd pop that in there to close up of that work. So this was kind of translated onto a canvas as well, which will be at the Icon Gallery in May. 
So book your tickets to see it if you like. Um, Bethan's just dropped the link in the chat for that as well. Um, but yeah, this kind of painter sculptor phase um, happened. And it's very strange because I don't usually use colour in my work, but when thinking about the representation of trauma, um, red has just kind of seeped into my work without me even realising. So it's quite different to my latex works. Um, this takes me on to me finding this object at the local car boot. Um, and it's an object that I'm drawn to because of its phallicness and its form. Um, and I kind of ended up making a lot of work around it, or at least my ideas have come from this form, this object, which is a duster, I think. Um, trying to put it into a place in the world, I staged a home intervention um, I placed it in on the banister knob in my flat um, and it kind of formed a central nervous system and it turned the space into something completely different. It's kind of the place you want to touch when you go upstairs, but it's kind of disturbed by this red growth type of thing. It's very invasive and even though it belongs in the domestic realm on here it doesn't it kind of transforms the place um so yeah then i created this piece of work which is basically a vinyl cast of that duster um it kind of forms like a growth or a type of gloop it's kind of maggoty and it is placed on the floor so you kind of look down at it and see this manifestation of uh, phallicness growing from the floor. And it is cast in vinyl, which is a quite permanent material. It won't degrade, which I found quite interesting as this is a material that I hadn't used before, as a lot of my works are kind of throwaway. But this was the first piece of work that I could say I could keep, which, was a bit different to my usual work. Um, and this brings me on to my recent play with kinetics. So I was in the studio and I was looking at my assemblage of random materials and I just took, these are mostly um, throwaway or discarded materials and I just combined them together and this came out. Um, I think it was quite interesting because it's kind of precarious. Um, I balanced all the elements of it so that it could stay there, but like if someone were to trip over it, it would just fall apart. Also, these are elements that I've reused in other pieces of work. So it is just a quick assemblage that you could easily take apart as well. And making this reminded me of an exhibition I saw at the Icon, which was Ray Nakajima, who'd made these little kinetic um, interventions in the gallery space. And they were all on timers and they went off at different times, reacted with each other, produced sounds. Um, and I went on to then make more kinetic works. Hopefully the sound works.
So hopefully the sound mark, if it didn't, at least you saw the little kinetic assemblages. The, these were all made of found objects um, and they're kind of comical and they've got this element to them where, um, especially on the film, um, they just are a continuation of like an irritating sound usually, um, which you kind of just waiting, maybe waiting for something to happen or maybe waiting for it to end, but it just doesn't. Um, and it's unlike any work that I've made before in the sense that it's more comical. Um, yeah, that's my kinetic series. Then I was kind of jotting down in my sketchbook about what my practice was, what kind of elements make up my practice, talking about the materials and the formality of my works. And out came this piece of writing, which was kind of a legacy of what my work is about. And I called it my manifesto for anticipated trauma. I was going to perform it, but I think we're going to be a little bit tight on time. So I will just show you the beginning of what it looks like. Um, it is, um, it's not just a piece of writing on paper. A lot of it is to do with the structure of how it's written. So with the whole paragraphs changing, switching sides of the paper, um, the punctuation, which kind of breaks some words up, but also leaves some lines hanging. And especially like the by a thread, the composition is very integral in the actual content of the writing. And it just lingers on this whole idea of anticipation and waiting. So thinking about these kind of elements and the waiting and the gravity and the anticipation, I made my next piece of work, which is called Pubic Pulley. And this was a work which kind of involved the audience in a way which I hadn't kind of done before. So the viewer would stand next to it and it would be in the pubic region and this whole kind of abject form would be suspended by a fishing hook and the tension of the rope would be held by a brick which was in the space of the room. I haven't actually got a very good photo of it documented, that's why I've got this like little scribble about what it's meant to look like. Um, but yeah, it kind of involves the audience in a way which my other works haven't involved them before. Um, then these are some of my more recent works. Um, this one called Hairy Dozen. As you can see, this is exactly the same egg carton as the one that was used in my first kinetic work, except this is a cast of the, that egg carton. So you can see that my materials are reused and made different in different ways in different pieces um, and they kind of remind me of like loads of little hairy boobs in a way these tufts of fur coming out I think formally works quite successfully in this particular piece um, this is another one of my really recent works I've, I made this within like the last two weeks um, an untitled piece. And this piece kind of reflects upon the first piece I showed you that I thought was quite successful with the, the latex and hair rats. Um, it plays on the notions of gravity. And this piece also contains um, a piece of work that I'd had before and dismantled, which is that cast of latex and PVA glue. Um, also, I've had like these um, subconsciously, I've taken in the repetitive form of like little sticks or something quite phallic 
And this is something that's beginning to repeat in my recent works a lot. Um, yeah. Especially in this one as well, where I'm experimenting with the wire and I'm cutting the wire back, the actual rubber of the wire, and then leaving the copper elements inside exposed with this combination of plastic. Um, plastic seems to be something that's creeping into my work a lot more recently as well. And these are my very, very recent works within the last week, again, that I'm really excited about at the moment. Um, they are baggies of different kinds of materials, but they're filled with water and secured um, by melting the plastic at the top with a glue gun. And the first one on the left is of nails and hair. And the water in both of these pieces is an active agent in the work itself. So across time, the work is transitioning into something else, something other, um, whilst also maintaining the formal element. So it's kind of maintaining this drawing-like element with the strands of hair. Um, and it's kind of combining all what I've talked about in one piece of work. Um, on the right, there's a piece that's made from reed fluff, which is a material that I've been experimenting with more recently. And the reed fluff is actually turning into something new. It was usually just brown, but something new is occurring within the um, plastic. And it's something that I could control to, exert, uh, to a certain extent, but ultimately I can't control what goes on in this plastic bag. The water is kind of doing the work and it's this combination of materials that works together, which makes this very successful. And I'm excited to experiment with this more, especially because I've never had work that's developed into something different over time. It's kind of a bit scientific, a bit experimental. So talking about the reed fluff a little bit more, it's a very, very, very new material to me. Um, I source it from a walkway, which is near my house. And I've kind of used this material and taken it into a context which questions its normative use. And I'm kind of working with a queer ecology in a sense. I have a book on this, but I haven't researched the material or queer ecologies as much as I'd like to. So I can't talk about it too much, but this is my material that I'd like to focus a lot more on and use more actively in my new works. So thank you for listening, everybody. Um, check out my website or any of the links that Bethan's dropped in the chat and any questions are welcome. Thank you so much, Carmela. It was like so great to hear more about your work. And even as someone like who's so familiar about it, it's great to see kind of the development of your practice. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a few questions. If anyone does have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or pop anything in the chat and then I will get to them shortly. So um, you kind of mentioned talk about Lady Gaga and I know you are a big fan of hers and um, that she does kind of creep up in your work sometimes. Do you see her as, in, as an artist in the same way you'd see someone like Frida Kahlo, as you mentioned as well? I would definitely, definitely, definitely consider Lady Gaga an artist just because I feel like artists are people who take their life experiences and share them with the world in a way that kind of impacts other people. And that's exactly what she's doing. She's taking her life experiences. She's turning them into music. She's turning them into music videos. She's turning them into movements um, just by being active on social media. So 
she's definitely, I think, one of the most influential artists of our times, I would argue. Yeah. You're obviously a very materials driven person and that's like very evident in your practice. So when you're creating a piece of work, what comes first? Do you have an idea for a piece of work or do you see materials and then go from there? How is, what is your process look like? I'd say that about eight times out of ten, I just have lots of materials in front of me that I've sourced from here, there and everywhere. And I'd kind of just start playing with them and start combining them, see what works with what. A lot of the times um, things don't work together and I just have to, like, take them apart or throw them away, try something new. And sometimes I do like little drawings in my sketchbook of maybe or maybe even like little formulas maybe I think oh latex and wire and hair might work together and I'll write it down and then I'll try and envision things in my head but I'd say like a lot of my successful works just come from the material play itself there's not a lot of planning involved at all it's all down to the intuition any questions for anyone in the audience oh yeah uh, Ryan uh, I absolutely love your work, Kamara. I I've seen it in person, but it's it's lovely to hear you talk about it. Um, I wanted to ask if your later work still, even subconsciously, touch on like does it still subconsciously touch on the idea of trauma, um, in either the outcome or the process of making. I think they definitely do, although that the trauma is not explicit and you wouldn't read it and think, oh, trauma um, <laughs> as like a non-art person. It's the whole repetitive movements and processes that I make and the repul compulsion to repeat, especially with some of the formal little lines and stuff. Um, still make it quite relevant to trauma and after all they're my subconscious imprints from my body just translated into my hands translated into the work so the trauma is always there even if it's just a little bit understated I've got a question in the chat here from Claudia um, Claudia says interesting work of presentation with trauma in life you often end up repeating something that has been forgotten is out of consciousness. Do you find that while you create these pieces, it helps you to remember? If not, how would you describe the benefits? Thank you. Well, some of the works, um, it's not always in the process that it happens. Sometimes I might make a work and look at it and I, I just think about something in my life that's happened and kind of realise that after, a particular experience is embodied in the work that I'd not really thought about during the making process. Um, and sometimes I make things and I'm just anxious and my anxiety and my stress is kind of fueling my hands and my process. It's different for different pieces of work. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Feel free everyone to keep putting questions in the chat and raising your hand if you do have any more. Do you find that your artwork in a sense becomes quite therapeutic in a way? Does it, has it helped to, to cope with anything, would you say? Yeah, definitely. Um, especially when I find the mo more repetitive works and like when I'm repeating a certain form I feel like that helps and it helps my mind my mind kind of switches off and I let my hand do the work um yeah we've got a question here from Andrea hi <laughs> uh thank you a lot for talking about your work it's the first time when I'm understanding what you're doing and I find it really impressive how you can change the meaning of an object and here i'm referring to i don't know if on the title is right is it called blue the red thing how you transform an object that you want to touch you want to fill it through your fingers in something 
kind of disgusting. <laughs> like <laughs> it looks like beef mains to me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and it's and it's amazing how you you kind of change this uh, way of seeing it. Was it just your intention to change the way you're looking at an object? Um, with that particular piece that you're talking about, Gloop, um, yes and no. <laughs> I kind of found this object so interesting and I thought, oh my gosh, what if I could cast it in vinyl and had no idea if it was going to work, if it wasn't, because the material itself, um, when you pull it off of something, I would have thought the phallic kind of material follicles would get stuck in the plaster itself and it wouldn't be successful but um i think the process of casting that particular object was more successful than i envisioned it to be and the translation of the material is something i find like very interesting especially with the cast of the egg carton as well um, that's what I love about materials and experimentation. You can turn something familiar into something quite unfamiliar quite quickly. And that's the beauty of materials. And that's why my practice is all about materials. Right, I've got a question from the chat uh, from Brad. It says, great presentation. I love the intersection of organic and inorganic materials. You've used hair and nails, but have you considered other bodily materials? I have considered like skin, but how do you get skin <laughs> without, well, Andrea has actually made some work with skin where she put, um, I, was it like skin from your foot or something in a jar of honey, which I thought was quite interesting. And she made some skin earrings as well. Um, it is quite difficult to, source bodily materials I guess because hair you can kind of find anywhere you can source it from your pluck hole um you can pluck your eyebrows um but and nails as well you can kind of chop off um I would consider anything really but I feel like hair can be manipulated in so many ways and it's great material in terms of line and texture and you can have different colored hair, which can work quite well, and you can build it up. I feel like hair is so versatile. Um, that's why I enjoy hair. I kind of repeat materials that I really enjoy. We've got a question from Ryan. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you have a favorite place to find materials or found objects? I actually don't have a favourite. I feel like it's really just potluck as to where you find stuff and why you find stuff. Um, some of the materials I sourced from my neighbour's garage, um, the reed fluff I sourced from outside, the hair I'd sourced from my hairbrush, um, what else? Chicken wire, I'd just, some things I'd find in the scrap saw, sometimes I'd find things at the car boot or lying on the street. It really depends. You can have um very different materials from lots of different places there isn't like a go-to place you just got to everything is about the material itself rather than where it's come from if that makes sense so it's been great to see like the development of your work especially with this kind of new way of the work creating itself in a sense in those bags and the reed fluff changing how do you see your work developing as you go forward? Do you see this idea of the work making itself carrying on or do you see it going in a completely different direction? I really hope so because my work kind of started off as static and it's only more recently like with the kinetics that movement has kind of come into that and having a time aspect to it as well as a gravity aspect and then the bags kind of continue all these ideas along and I feel like it's heading somewhere into the unknown but I'm not sure quite where it's heading but I'd hope that I'd have more kind of happy accidents because them 
bag pieces with the water were happy accidents. Like my silly brain didn't think when you put nails and water together, it would rust. It kind of just, you know, it's science. So I need to think more like a scientist, I think in order to shift my practice forward because I've been in an artist mindset, but now because of that accident, I need to shift my mentality in order for that area to grow, literally. Do we have any last questions from anyone in the audience before we wrap this up? Oh yeah, uh, Brad. Hi, Carmela. <laughs> um, so I know a lot of your work comes from trauma and um, your work operates as a kind of art therapy in sense to process that trauma in a very visceral way. Um, how do you think you'd be able to, or do you think you'd be able to produce art without use of trauma in the sense that, do you think you could come from a non-traumatic place in producing art? That's an interesting question because I feel like my, <laughs> I feel like my work, even though even before I kind of linked it to trauma, it must have come from somewhere in order to work in that way. Even when I was making the first work with the latex and the hair, I didn't think of it as um, an imprint of trauma, but I feel like to have that gravity and to have that kind of quiet muted element to it it must have had to come from somewhere in the subconscious I feel like like Lady Gaga's work your life is so integral I can't say that word integral integral it's so important it's such an important part of your practice and your practice is usually based around your experience with life so um everyone has trauma it's just a subconscious thing that happens in my making in particular. Do we have any final questions before we wrap this up? No? Okay, so Kamala, where can people find you if they want to see more of your work? You can find me on Instagram at Carmela Vienna. You can find me on my website, um, carmelavienna.co.uk. Yeah, and you can find me in Birmingham. <laughs> well thank you so much Carmela it's been great to hear about your work and I'm sure everyone's enjoyed it just as much as I have oh there's another message in the chat not a question and this is from um William Scholl not a question I just wanted to say it's been a great talk and I love the idea of thinking about art from a scientific point of view especially in regards to how the materials interact really fascinated to see how this may play into your future work thank and you I William so am I and I think that's really great to end on. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, please make sure you follow us on all our social medias around double underscore lemon. And you can also find us over on roundlemon.co.uk where you can um, sign up to our newsletter and see all our future events coming up next week with Fiona Campbell's Artist Tour. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you everyone for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.